In John chapter 5, Jesus travels back to Jerusalem, and there's a festival that's taking place. But as he's on his way to the festival, he passes a place that's often referred to as Bethesda, the Pool of Bethesda, or the Sheep Gate. And it's this place where there were people who had different disabilities. They would lay there, whether they were blind, whether they were lame or paralyzed, or, or different types of infirmities, the scripture says, that they would deal with. They would be at this gate, and at this gate there was a pool. And there was a... Um, at this pool, there was this tradition that an angel would come once a year, would stir the waters, and that the first one that got into the waters would miraculously be healed. And I'm not going to lie to you, there's a lot of debate theologically around the story. There are some people who believe that there really was an angel that would come down and stir the waters, and someone who got in first would get healed. And then there were others that believed that, no, this was just superstition. This was just religious tradition, and they would just hang here waiting for the water to move and would jump in. And, and, and honestly, I don't know. It really doesn't matter. To be honest with you, in the context of the story, it really doesn't matter. It's one of the things I look forward to talking to God about one day. Hey, was this literal or was this a tradition of men? But there were this, this group of people who were dealing with disabilities and infirmities that would hang around this pool and would wait to get into this pool to be healed if an angel came up and stirred the waters. Jesus walks by this man that's there, and the Bible goes out of its way to say that he's been there for 38 years. He was most likely not born this way. A lot of times in the scripture, whenever someone was born with an illness or born with a disease, they would say it was at birth, like when the man was healed from being blind. They said he was blind from birth. But whenever there's a illness, a disease, a disability that you picked up during your life, it would often say the years, like the woman with the issue of blood had this issue for 12 years, or this man was paralyzed for 38 years. And Jesus comes by him and he asks him this question that honestly, it can sound kind of crazy on the outside. It doesn't really even make sense when he asks it because it's such an obvious question. It's almost rhetorical. He asks him, do you want to be made whole? Well, who that's sick wouldn't want to be better? Who that is dealing with a disability wouldn't want to be operating at full ability? Who wouldn't want to be made whole? But we know in the scripture, whenever there's something that's highlighted by the Holy Spirit, there's a reason for everything. So here's the question that I begin to ask myself as I read this passage in John chapter 5. God, why would you ask this question? Do you want to be made whole? So we have this man who's talking to Jesus. And Jesus asks him, do you want to be made whole? And the man says, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool. Sir, whenever, whenever the angel stirs the water or whatever would take place, he would say, I don't have anyone to help me to get in. People are always getting in before me. There are people who are always having their miracle before me. He says, I, I don't have the help that I need. And there was something powerful that he said. He was right. He didn't have the help that he needed. But he was looking for one, he was looking at one location to get the help that he needed. And he was looking at a spot. And he should have been looking at the person that was right in front of him. It was his Lord. Jesus Christ is standing right in front of him. He alone has the power to give life, to bring life, to heal. Jesus says something so powerful to him in John chapter 5, verse 8. He says, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. He says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. He's not even addressing the issue that he was dealing with. He's not even addressing the disability. He's speaking to the man of the potential that is inside him. And he says, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And the scripture says that at once the man was cured, and he picked up his mat, and he walked. But the day on which this took place was the Sabbath. The day in which this took place was the holy day, the holy day of rest. But Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders, verse 10, they were upset. They said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. The rules say you can do no work on this day. And really, really what the Sabbath meant was you cannot produce. The principle of the Sabbath is that when it says that God rested from all his work, it's saying that you don't produce. But they, they took it to extremes and said, you can't even pick something up. I can't even pick up my Bible right now. It, it was so extreme. And they asked him, who is the man that told you to do this? Who is the man that healed you? Who is the man that told you to pick it up and walk? And the man had no idea who it was. He had no idea who had told him. Isn't it crazy how a man who was disabled for 30 years, eight years, is miraculously healed. 
And all that the Pharisees, all that the religious people cared about was that he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Rather than rejoicing with this man who was paralyzed but is now able to walk, rather than celebrating with this man and the new victory that he's walking in, rather than celebrating that the old has passed away and that the new has come, all that they could focus on, all that they could care about was that he was carrying his mat on the Sabbath. And the story tells us that Jesus comes back to him later in verse 14. It says, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you are all well again. Stop sinning or something worse may, ha may happen to you in the future. And the man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And from then on, they wanted to kill Jesus and they wanted to try to trap Jesus. But it's a powerful statement that Jesus made. He said, stop sinning so that something worse doesn't happen to you. I'm not gonna lie to you, this statement has troubled me at times when I've read it. And I really... While it's not super clear in the scripture, what I really feel took place from the details that we're able to pull from the story, when it says that the man was paralyzed for 38 years, this means that he was most likely not born this way. And so when it says, stop sinning, lest something worse happen to you, I wonder if in his life, Jesus knowing what took place, there was something that he did that was foolish or was wrong, uh, maybe, and I'm making things up, maybe he was under the influence and tried to jump off of a roof, maybe he was um, under the influence and was riding a horse or a donkey or doing something foolish, or he tried to do something that left him injured. In that injury he had carried for the last 38 years. And Jesus said this powerful statement to him, he said, stop sinning so that something worse doesn't happen to you. I believe the spirit of what Christ was trying to communicate is, okay, you've received grace for your actions. Now don't frustrate that grace and go back to the actions that got you where you were. Walk in the fullness of that grace. And I would give this example to you. There are times in our lives where you know, we receive grace, we receive mercy, we don't get what we, we do deserve, we get what we don't deserve, and someone shows us favor, someone shows us grace, but they do it so that we will change, so that we will repent, meaning to change direction, meaning we won't go back to where we were. You may look back at a season of your life and say, man, I really messed it up, but someone showed me grace, and they showed you that grace hoping that you wouldn't go back and find yourself in the same place. Jesus is giving this man this warning saying, don't go back and find yourself at the same pool because you made the same poor decisions. And I believe that that speaks to my life, that that speaks to our lives in this. When God shows us grace in an area of our life, we're not to frustrate the grace of God, but we're to walk. We're to pick up our mat. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. We're to walk in the fullness of the grace of God. Be blessed today.